subject for this evening is rather more interesting, perhaps, than the title would indicate. And it requires a kind of orientation, which I believe will contribute to our knowledge on a number of religious subjects. The story of the golden legend and its author, Jacob de Vorigen, belongs to the 13th century of the Christian era. The work and the man were strongly em em emphasized and influenced by the psychology of the time. The European culture was passing through what we now call the medieval period, a long and difficult time, distinguished rather for its reactionary tendencies than for any contribution to progress. The medieval European uh, was a person of extremely limited education and an almost completely provincial attitude. His life was circumscribed by old patterns and beliefs and folklore to a degree that it is difficult for us to appreciate. The church could not be different from its own time. Its clerics were drawn from the available material of the day. And even those who ascended to relatively high position in the ecclesiastical structure were men of very limited education and, in many instances, ability. We cannot, therefore, expect a great a mature philosophical work to rise from such conditions. We cannot even expect an outstanding literary production. We must recognize that the 13th century European depended almost entirely upon folklore for his moral instruction, for his ethical concepts of life, and for the fulfillment of his hungers for knowledge. Folklore at that time was derived from a number of different sources. Some European, some Near Eastern, and others North African. There was no clear effort to distinguish between the sources of material. They were heaped together. We have a few evidences of what might be termed the learned thinking of that time. And to our eyes, to our comprehension, the scene was most distressing. Yet we cannot say that there was not sincerity or dedication, or a great longing to discover a better way of life, or to attain a deeper understanding of the mysteries of religion. At that time in Europe, there was only one church. There were splinters in smaller areas, but the burden of Christianity rested with the development of the Catholic Church. And within this church were produced men who were to add greatly to the luster, not only of their faith, but of the arts, and to the great uh, contributions that they made, uh, we give natural homage. The story of the golden legend is essentially a martyrology. 
It was a kind of saint's calendar. And under each day of the year was a suitable sanctified name. It is obvious that Jacobus, who was a citizen of Genoa, was not too solid in his history. But in all fairness, we should point out that he admitted it. He tells us in his book when he is confused, and that is quite frequently, that he tried definitely to create an inspiring work that would contribute to the well-being of the faithful. As a result of his teachings and preachings, he was elected Archbishop of Genoa by the congregation, not by a political move, but by the natural uh, fondness that the people held for him. After his death, he was beatified, but never canonized. But the Dominican order has special rights to venerate him and to accord him many of the dignities of a saint. The martyrology or the golden legend deals with saints. And the more we study this work, the more we recognize that the tradition preserved in hagiology is far more interesting and perhaps more stimulating that the average person believes. We think of a saint simply as a very good person within the orthodoxy of his church who has been elevated to sanctification by an elaborate ecclesiastical process. This was not actually true in old times. The primary qualifications for sanctification in the beginning were martyrdom and miracles. Uh, the distinguished and pious person who died for his religion was held to have a peculiar estate, superior to that of even the ordinary devout person. If, for one reason or another, the saint escaped martyrdom, then the proof of his sanctification uh, lay in miracles. These miracles might be performed during his lifetime, or they might be recorded after his death. The more common process was that miracles should occur at his tomb, or that persons with various troubles praying to his honored name might find extraordinary relief from their miseries. These two general forms have still survived. And it is rather interesting to note that the golden legend, which is a really a calendar of saints, was sufficiently popular in its own time to be perpetuated by nearly 500 manuscript copies. Of course, all this occurred before the beginning of printing. But so large a number testified to the great demand for the work. After the invention of printing, it passed through 150 editions, most of them comparatively early, however. An interest in the work began to decline with the Renaissance. At that time, humanism began to sweep the world, and men's attention was turned from matters of ancient religion to the pressing concerns of modern reformation. The various versions of the golden legend, however, continue to appear. And a recent English translation was published in 1941 under the imprimatur of Francis Cardinal Spellman, which would indicate that the subject has not entirely lost modern interest at least within the body of the church. I think that the first thing we learn from the golden legend is something about the personalities, natures, and qualifications 
of the early saint martyrs. The more we study this uh, description, and a number of writers have remarked this point, which is not at all original with me, the more we realize that the saint really emerges as a transcendentalist. He is a magician. He is a sage. He was a seer. He worked miracles. He could transport himself invisibly from one place to another. He was able to appear in countless forms and to extend his ministry over inconceivable periods of time. When we are all finished with the, the general pattern, we see that there is a startling similarity between the saints of early Christendom and the wonder workers, magicians, yogis, and the arhats of Oriental religion. The saint in many instances was almost a complete parallel for the Buddhist arhat. He renounced the world. This he held in common with uh, most uh, religious groups. He practiced austerities. He gave up all physical honors and comforts. He sought only one thing, the grace of God. He proved his dedication by selfless service to others. And his miracles were nearly always performed for the benefit of the oppressed or the poor or the downtrodden. He held all the strange and wonderful powers that we associate with the Oriental Mahatma. Many of the sanctified persons were as eccentric and strange and difficult to comprehend as the old Arhats of Zen. And I imagine, had we any kind of um, likenesses of them, they would indeed be equally a motley group of rich and poor, wise and simple, who had by one manner of effort or another had achieved that end which all well-disposed persons desire. That was the enrichment and fulfillment of eternal re and internal resources. So it is interesting to trace something of the beginning of the story of the saints not as individuals, but as a type, which in one form or another has appeared in so many parts of the world. Where did the Christian idea of canonization come from? It did not come from the Old Testament. It was not a common policy of the Orthodox Jews of that time. We find no real trace of it in Greek culture, nor does it show, formally speaking, in any phase of Roman belief. We say, formally speaking, because there is one parallel that may be worth noting, and that was the process of the deification of Roman emperors. Uh, a Roman emperor, however, when he was deified, uh, might have his likeness raised as a monument in the city, and he would receive popular veneration and adulation. Some emperors were deified during their lifetimes, and so were some of the Macedonian kings of Greece. But in these instances, a deification was largely based upon some heroic incident. These uh, emperors were not deified because they were good. They were deified because they were powerful. They were recognized as examples of the prevailing psychological standard of the time, where strength and, if necessary, cruelty these were condoned and applauded if they led to ultimate victory, if they advanced the destiny of the state, all personal considerations were ignored. 
First, the deification of the emperors, either of uh, the Latin or the North African cultures, really do not, really does not cover our point, but it has a bearing on it, as uh, we hope to demonstrate. The saint, as far as we can understand him, certainly appears to be an oriental importation. The type of person that was venerated and canonized by the early church possessed those virtues that were most applauded among Eastern peoples. This does not mean that the good man would not have been regarded as good in his own country. He might have been greatly beloved. He might have been remembered with extraordinary fondness. But our saint is not just this good man. He was good according to the way of his time. And in many instances, he was certainly a spiritual hero. But he was more than this. He was wise. He was skilled. He was learned in many ways, mostly in the ways of mysticism and esotericism. These words, of course, were never used, but his attributes indicated in this direction. So we might look a little bit to try and discover how it came about that about the first century A.D., this development of the idea of formal canonization or the bestowing upon the venerated dead certain spiritual powers of intercession with God. To try to understand this a little better, we will we'll probably have to travel a bit to another part of the world. When Alexander the Great led his conquests into the East, he reached as far as what is now Pakistan, and then the continual dissensions of his armies and uh, the desire of his soldiers to live, to return to their own homes, uh, dissuaded him from further conquest. In uh, what is now Pakistan, there developed a mingling of Greek and Indian culture, East Indian culture. Uh, this revealed itself by some, at least semi-permanent, uh, cultural monuments. After Alexander had departed, these naturally fell into decline. There was nothing to maintain the Greek influence in Pakistan. But about the beginning of the Christian era, Pakistan, this area of it, and parts of Afghanistan became the outer boundaries of the Roman Empire. There was a communication between this area and Italy. Merchants traveled, artisans lived and in, in Pakistan and perpetuated Roman customs, Roman arts. The peculiar mingling, therefore, of an Eastern tradition moving de definitely westward and a Western culture moving relentlessly eastward resulted in a, a very interesting a composite culture which has come to be known as Gandhara. Gandhara was a province or country of no great political importance, part of which is now in Pakistan and part in Afghanistan. From the first to the fifth century, the Gandhara enjoyed an extraordinary flowering of art, particularly sculpturing and modeling. 
Gandhara, during this early period, in the latter part of the first and the early part of the second century A.D., also became a great stronghold of Buddhism. And the country was literally covered with monuments of Buddhistic thought. Although Buddha himself had never actually journeyed through this region. In the early years of the second century A.D., as far as we can learn today, Dandara produced the first human likeness of Buddha. Prior to that time, no effort had been made to represent this great Indian teacher as a person. He was represented only by symbols. Among these symbols, was the wheel of the law, which has since been seen so often on the Sokas column, which has more recently become the official symbol of the Indian Republic. The second symbol associated with Buddha was the teaching chair, where he would be seated discoursing to his disciples. It was a low, throne-like structure, sometimes supported by lions. The third symbol peculiarly associated with Buddha at this period was the footprint, a, a device resembling the human foot, but usually larger, the sole of the foot being covered with an intricate pattern of symbolical designs. If it was therefore considered appropriate to represent Buddha, a congregation of the believers might be gathered about the teaching throne. Above the throne would be the chakra or wheel, and below the throne on the ground in front, the footprints. This was all that was used to symbolize the great teacher. But in the rise of the Dandara art, there gradually appeared the personification of the teacher. Modern archaeologists think of this by saying, that here in Gandhara, uh, the likeness of Buddha was first devised. The anthropomorphic process produced the physical embodiment of the unknown appearance. This physical embodiment itself is very interesting to us. The figures are usually standing wearing a long and beautifully draped toga. The feet are sandaled, as in uh, the type of sandal found in both Greece and Rome. The face is Grecian, very often with a straight nose with a high arch or bridge. The eyebrows are of Greek arch also. And the hair is arranged as in statues of the Apollo Belvedere or the God of the Sun. The only actually distinguishing peculiarities which would divide the Gandhara representation of Buddha from almost any other type of classical Greek or Latin sculpturing were the three peculiar symbols associated with Buddha as a person one being the urna, or the small coil between the eyebrows, represented almost as a cast mark. The second was the usnisha, or the high protruding dome of the head. And the third was the elongated ears. These were about the only differences that could be found. The question arises, how did these peculiar attributes come to be incorporated immediately into the Gandhara likenesses, probably from the ancient scriptural descriptions found in the sutras. At this time, the Buddha was represented with long, wavy hair, uh, either in a Greek form or perhaps even suggesting the early uh, hairdress of native Indian princes. At the top of the hair was arranged as a shinyon, 
and there was none of the little tight curls that we see today. The figure was graceful, dignified, and when walking with a group of disciples similarly clothed, the Buddha very closely resembles a Greek philosopher or a Roman scholar. The bodily proportions are said to be largely of Roman extraction, belonging to a somewhat depraved art following the Roman adaptation of the Greek art. So the rather profane and unromantic archaeologist says that the original likeness of Buddha was a composition or composite of an Eastern deity, perhaps Krishna, a Grecian sun god, uh, Helios or Apollo, and a deified Roman emperor. These were the contributing factors according to modern thinking. Whether this can be justified or not is hard to say, but we must realize that up to 100 years ago, Gandhara art was unknown. It was not discovered until that time. Now it is to be found in some of the choicest collections of the world. So in the Gandhara carvings, Buddha is usually shown with a flat, simple nimbus. There is a halo behind the head. In general Asiatic art, bodhisattvas are also haloed. And in the Chinese and Indic schools of Buddhism, the arhats are haloed. The uh, higher persons of this sublime hierarchy have more elaborate halos, such as the nimbus and the aureole, or the double halo. But with the arhats, it was almost always just a simple disc or circle surrounding the head. Where else is this halo to be found? Possibly in parts of India associated with the deities. Very little evidence of it anywhere in the Near East or in Europe. It would seem, therefore, that the artistic exchange between the Roman Empire and Gandhara may have strongly influenced uh, the selection of the Buddhistic type for the identification of saints. There seems to be really no other way in which we can trace all the elements of the pattern. Now, if it be said that we are extravagant in this, there is one other point that stands out rather in an interesting way. In the Golden Legend, the 20th to 27th of November in the Saint's calendar is assigned to the Saint Josephet. A study of the account given in the Golden Legend is very interesting. So while it is highly Christianized, the fact seems to shine through. The facts seem to shine through. Once in a very distant region, not quite geographically identified, there was a king. And this king had an only son. And when this son was born to him, the wise men came and told the king that his son would either be a ruler of the world or a great teacher of mankind. The king greatly disturbed at the possibility of his son taking religious orders. Therefore, built a palace, and here he kept his son away from all the common sights of mankind. Age, sickness, death were never seen by this young prince. He lived in luxury and wealth and joy and happiness. He made a very brilliant marriage to a very beautiful princess, and it seemed that his life was assured. 
But in this occasion, the saints, the angels, and of course, according to the uh, golden legend, uh, Christian teachers, uh, reached this young man and revealed to him the sorrows of the world, how all worldliness was vanity, and why he should devote his life entirely to preaching the true faith. Under the influence of these teachers, the young prince renounced his kingdom, took off his princely robes, put on the costume of a monk, and became a teacher. Many wonderful conversions were made by him. He taught for a very great many years, and when the time came for him to die, he was taken up to heaven by the angels. Now, the sober scholars of the moment are inclined to feel that in some way Buddha himself got into the Christian martyrology. And uh, I think it is only fair to point out that the Catholic Encyclopedia at the present time says that Josephat is a corruption of Bodhisattva, and that St. Josephat was Buddha. Now this is uh, rather interesting, and some uh, sources far more learned than the encyclopedia have also come to the same conclusion. There seems to be no reasonable doubt that in some way uh, Buddha attained canonization. If this occurred, there is no reason to doubt some rather definite connection between early Christianity and India. Now, we are not for a moment attempting to say uh, that Christianity is a Hindu religion. Nothing of that nature is intended. What we are inclined to suspect, however, is uh, that the original Christian communities cut off almost totally uh, from the major streams of world progress of their time, most of them in isolated and desolate regions, uh, founded by groups with little or no social standing, and for centuries almost continuously persecuted, that these communities lean heavily upon folklore uh, for the legends and stories which gradually came to be included in the sacred canon of saints. Uh, they derived their heroes from anything that was heroic. And the peculiar similarity between the ritualism and sacerdotalism of Buddhism and Christianity has been a thorn in the flesh of missionaries ever since. A Buddhist country is one of the poorest areas to attempt to develop Christian missions. Not because of the antagonism of the people, but because of the immense similarity of the doctrines. There seems to most uh, Buddhists no particular reason why they should be converted. Their own philosophy is almost identical. Now, if this experience occurred back at the beginning of the Christian era, it might explain a number of legends that even went down as far as the Middle Ages. The legends of the great Christian empire of the East, for example, governed by John the Presbyter. It was believed that from the very earliest times, this great Christian empire had flourished somewhere in Gobi or in the northern hem of that and that uh, the teaching given to the, to the people there was identical with Christianity. Well, uh, Christian missions were not established that early, even though the Nestorians did reach China at a comparatively early date. So it's very possible that in Asia Minor there was a mingling of traditions and a meeting of minds. United already to Europe by the Silk Road, 
Asia was sending its silks and brocades to make garments for the Roman empresses. So the far places were not totally unknown. It is very possible that from the figures at Gandhara and a little later the rise of a more florid art of the same kind throughout northern and particularly north uh, western India might well have provided the concept for the old Buddhist monk as represented in these carvings wore the simple robes that we now associate with the apostles. He was shaven-headed, he carried a staff, he wore a monkish robe, very simple garments, sometimes bound at the waist by a cord, and behind his head was a disk of light. This is almost all that was required. And uh, with the possible exception of the mingling of Eastern thought with the Egyptian tradition at a very early date, there seems to be no other convenient explanation for the rise of a design or pattern that appeared simultaneously in Asia and in Europe. That is the pattern of the holy man. In both areas, holiness led to extraordinary spiritual achievements. The transcendency achieved by the saint became the basis of a new kind of heroic being. Some of the philosophy of this may have been derived from the Greeks, but not the appearance. The Greeks also had their heroes. But again, the heroes were largely men of valor. A deification might come by the individual being picked out of the material world, carried to the heights of Olympus, there to mingle with the gods, and perhaps have his image or likeness translated to the stars. These legends existed. In the Greek initiation rituals, it is known that the hero represented the self-disciplined person, the individual who had transcended his own ignorance and had dedicated himself to the universal good of others. This dedication to the universal good certainly permeates uh, the golden legend, although some of the expressions of it are extraordinarily crude. Another interesting possibility arises in the case of the sanctification of St. Catherine of Alexandria. Here again we have almost certainly a pagan borrowing. From the story as found in the Golden Legend, we must be inclined to suspect that St. Catherine is nothing but a Christianizing of Hypatia of Alexandria. The brief description given in the Golden Legend clearly states that this, for them, Christian maiden, was extremely learned in philosophy and the mathematics, was a great scholar, and was probably the most learned woman of her time. At that time, there was only one woman known in history that corresponded to such a title. And that was the daughter of Theon the Mathematician, the head of the Neoplatonic School of Alexandria. She was the close friend of Bishop Synesius, who also had an interesting part to play in the strange mixing and minglings of early Christian and non-Christian traditions. Synesius was appointed bishop after the church had agreed to permit, to permit him to keep his wife and live with her. He refused to give her up. But they were in such desperate need of a good bishop in that region that they uh, agreed to his, shall we say, eccentricity. Synesius 
also required that the church should say clearly at all times that the new bishop was a Christian in the performance of his duties, but that in his heart he would always remain a pagan. This they also agreed to do. They must have been right short-handed in those days. Genesius was a friend of Hypatia and frequently consulted her on important matters of both religion and science. And it is said that through her assistance, he was able to produce advanced forms of water clocks and other means of measuring time. Now, the truth of the matter is, of course, that Hypatia never became a Christian. In fact, she was a pagan martyr who was killed by Christians. Here we have a case that is not too dissimilar, though not entirely parallel, with that of Jeanne d'Arc. In the uh, case of Hypatia, uh, she was dragged through the street by a frantic group of ignorant and bigoted monks. Her body was broken on the rack. She was beaten to death, and then the flesh was scraped from her bones with oyster shells. A little later, she emerges at St. Catherine. Changing of times, changing of thought. The early people undoubtedly had less theology but more humanity. They realized that any person who is willing to die a terrible death for their convictions has something of holiness in them. And they were a little less cautious in uh, selecting their martyrs in those days. The legends of great and good people seem to have strongly influenced the thinking of that time. Now we remember that the golden legend was compiled in the 13th century. Most of the accounts which it contains belong to the first five centuries of the Christian era. Therefore, between these events and kindly and well-intentioned Jacobus was an interval of over 700 years. 700 dismal years. Years without adequate history. Without any uh, proper uh, alignment of events. Centuries of darkness and ignorance and illiteracy of the scatterings of people, when perhaps the only medium for the perpetuation of anything was the old wives' tales. They alone served as the basis uh, of a communication. Now, at the time this was happening, uh, two other uh, elements appeared in Christian thinking, uh, both of a very highly supernatural type. Ordinary folks had very little possibility of contemplating the natures of the archangels. But the angel became very important to them. The angel as the minister of deity, as the servant of the Holy Trinity, was not only a reminiscent of the Annunciation of Mary, but according to the old tales, angels always appeared in emergency. And somewhere along the way, the idea of the guardian angel came into existence. An idea that has never been officially recognized by the church, but is said to be of the mind of the congregation. Guardian angels were probably borrowed from Egypt. But they passed through a certain transformation. So that space, the invisible part of, of the world, uh, became more or less the abode of these invisible ministers of the Almighty. Angelic forms appeared in art at a comparatively early date. And of course, the same general idea of angels was common throughout Asia and does occur with some modifications in both Greece and Egypt. Certainly there were spirit messengers who came largely 
in visions and in dreams. These messengers console the needy, promised relief to the desolate, and in one way or another uh, were the invisible servants of the divine good. So the angel also shared honors with the saint as a metaphysical factor in life. Of course, perhaps even more important than the angel or the saint, however, was the prime villain of the time, the devil. And in the golden legend, he is really present almost everywhere, always. Of all the concepts that have arisen in man's mind, there is none beyond God himself to whom as much authority has been given as to the devil. So in the uh, stories of the golden legend, there is a certain monotony for all the various episodes are more or less impelled by satanic intervention. Whenever anything evil was to be done, the devil was always back of it. It was the devil who hardened the hearts of Roman emperors. It was the devil who uh, devised incredible means to torture the sanctified. So if the people of that time, simple folk that they were, had faith in good on the one hand, they had fear of evil very strongly implanted in their consciousness. The devil might appear in almost any guise. It might be a beautiful maiden leading some young swain astray. He might take the form of a beloved bishop and preach false doctrines. He might even appear to be a saint, but always somewhere there was evidence of his cloven hoof. The devil took on all kinds of forms, but always for one purpose only, to lead men away from the truth. Now this devil is likewise comparatively missing in most of the religions that led up to Christianity in the West. There were evil gods, but never did they develop such extraordinary ingenuity as after they had been Christianized. The devil took on every face and likeness, and to the devil was blamed anything which in any way reflected against the honor of the faith. The devil was a combination of some old Jewish elements, though so, um, they were not uh, nearly as exaggerated, and other folk beliefs and primitive faiths of people. The general tendency was, in early Christianity, to make devils out of the gods of non-Christian people. This uh, was understandable, perhaps because of the persecutions that the early Christian community suffered. But the real devil, as he appears in the Golden Legend, is far too advanced and sophisticated a character uh, to merely be the result of accidental selection. He was more than the building of a myth. He emerges gradually as a principle, a principle so clearly defined that he may very well be termed the adversary. But this adversary plagued everyone, plagued the saints, tempted Jesus. This adversary was ever present in the medieval consciousness. It was not uncommon to carve likenesses of devils on the backs of pews to remind people of evil even while they were worshiping. Uh, it was assumed that almost all mental disease was demoniac possession, and it was treated largely by exorcism. 
anything that was strange or difficult or uncomfortable or unpleasant or disconcerting had an imp behind it somewhere. There was no concept among these people that they might be the devil, that their own conduct, their own attitudes might be the cause of their misfortunes. Everything that was good came from God. Everything that was bad came from the devil. And the only way to escape from evil was through the intercession of saints, or through calling upon the pious to stand as hostage for the delinquent soul. The little fragments of this show up in Egyptian mythology, but we are still dealing with something more organic, something more basic. It's almost certain from the reading, reading of the golden legend that the devil is merely another version of the Indian deity Mara or sometimes referred to as Yama. It was Mara and his host of temptations that sought to disturb Buddha at the time of the Enlightenment. It was Mara who cast the glamour of unreality upon all existence. It was Mara that was responsible for the rise of egoism in man. Thus Mara became a symbol of mundane conditions, perhaps similar in concept to the idea that Caesar became the emblem of the false god, Caesar being merely the symbol of temporal power, of human ambition, and of the corruption resulting from selfishness. So yeah, it seemed quite reasonable that this devil that was everywhere always it could only actually represent an attitude toward life that was essentially unreal. Our forebears in those early days did not rationalize this. But there still is abundant evidence that in their psychology they were at least subjectively aware of this principle. They did not know the answers as we know them to some of these problems. But they were aware that the devil represented a common enemy. And they also realized that the only escape from this enemy was the constant contemplation of spiritual realities. That in the time of all emergency, man must choose between good and evil. Good represented not only by God, but his saints and his angels evil by the demon and his minions. And for every saintly quality there was an infernal counterpart. And just as God ruled in the heavens, so Beelzebub, prince of the dead and of the devils, ruled in the underworld. The underworld had its equivalent of archangels and angels and saints, but they were all infernal, negative, inverted reflections of the spiritual truths. Thus, evil was good perverted. Evil was nothing more than the victory of selfishness over truth, over reality, over the divine plan of things. Men were being constantly tempted uh, to accept false values. And these false values were finally summed up in the old virtues which the saints sought to exemplify. To escape from the devil, man had to renounce the world. It was good Hindu philosophy, good Buddhistic philosophy, good Chinese morality. The devil, therefore, became a kind of an embodied adversary for whichever way man turned and however he tried to do good, evil was ever nigh unto him. Every force that he possessed, every faculty that existed within him, every sensory perception had two faces, a face of good and a face of evil. Use always suggested abuse. 
Abuse always corrupted use. Power became the basis of persecution and tyranny. Man could never depend upon himself. Whenever he really tried to be good, the temptation to be evil was strengthened in him. His very efforts were his undoing. And he could only turn and beseech heaven to save him from this in intangible mechanism that closed in upon him constantly, this misuse of his own natural powers. In the golden legend, uh, the devil hardened the hearts of men. It is illusion, it is selfishness, it is arrogance that hardens the hearts of men. When we contradict a man, he becomes angry, not because we are wrong or he is right, but because we have contradicted him and a flare of hate arises within him. When we come to some conclusion contrary to that of our neighbor, our neighbor resents us. Again, it is selfishness, it is egoism that cannot bear to be corrected. It is a wise person indeed who will permit himself to be challenged without becoming angry. Everywhere in this world as we live in it today, we can see the relentless process by which everything that we thought would accomplish good has gradually been corrupted. We see every discovery exploited. We see every invention used to hurt rather than to help. We see forever the desperate effort to profit by the labors of others. The instinct to tyrannize, to hold down, to depress. The flaring into hate which we express to anyone and against anyone who seeks to escape from the little prisons we have built for them. Thus, an, an ancient people, not particularly learned, not able to fully understand these things, could well assume that this adversary was real. It seemed that it operated with extraordinary cunning. It read our minds. It knew our hearts. It frustrated our steps relentlessly. The only thing they did not understand, of course, was the reason why this spirit knew so much, was that this spirit was in us and knew us completely. It represented the negative polarity, the anti-self. It represented the old atavistic being, always striving to drag us back again to our own more primitive state. The devil always operated through temptation. And temptation, of course, is opportunity. And the individual who has an opportunity to profit at the expense of his ethics may very likely grasp that opportunity. Thus it is said that men sold their souls to the devil. And we have the mysterious Faustian complex in which the individual sacrifices his eternal glory for the sake of the extension of his temporal powers. The golden legend gives us this concept and places between the average person and this terrible dilemma the power of his faith, the power of the church militant, with the vision of the church triumphant. Christianity became the power that could frustrate the force of evil. It was a declaration of war against the devil. And the only way this war could be won was by leading men away from materiality. For whether it was in Asia or in the West, there's very little difference in the motivation. It was always the same. The effort to find security, serenity, spiritual strength. In the Christian martyrology, however, all these virtues were bestowed by the grace of God. It was not assumed that the individual could save himself. 
And this was, of course, the great line of differentiation between Eastern and Western thinking. In the West, man could not win by himself. He could only go a certain way. And even in this part of the journey, he had to receive the continuous support of guardian spirits, of venerated saints. And he had to know in a mysterious way that the very Holy Trinity itself was aware of his emergency. Thus, in the uh, Christian version of this problem, deity also takes on a new likeness. Deity becomes the personification of principles, even as the demon becomes the personification of vice. Both the East and the West was essentially the same, through silence, through humility, and through the renunciation of the complexities and temptations which may lure man into evil. It was assumed that no one was actually secure. We might feel that we have achieved a great deal, that our righteousness is uh, enough. <coughs> but even then, temptation takes on some other complicated form in these to come. Without the grace of God, or the benediction of a spiritual force descending upon and within man, virtue is impossible to him in Western mysticism. His, uh, his achievement, therefore, is that he shall become the friend of God, that he shall enjoy the um, love of God through obedience, through keeping the law, through practicing the virtues, and if in this process of absolute dedication to his God, his adversaries shall afflict him greatly then his spiritual estate is heightened. He is even more certain of salvation. If he is tortured, then it is obvious to him that he is making the supreme sacrifice for God. That he is rejoicing in pain, because this pain assures his salvation and is the final testimony of his complete sincerity. If in the course of this suffering, martyrdom shall come to him, as it came to all but one of the original apostles, then indeed he has walked in the footsteps of his Savior, just as the little people of New Mexico in their penitenti rites feel that if they carry their cross and are flagellated as Christ was flagellated, they share in a mysterious way in the experience of their Lord, they become more capable of knowing him, of realizing his infinite mercy through their own suffering. This attitude was European. It led finally, of course, to the great orders of penitence that arose in Europe, the Misericordia, and other organizations which may be termed brotherhoods of pain pain being in some way the visible proof of internal, invisible dedication. The stories in the golden legend most naturally end in martyrdom. I think in many instances this legend uh, affected the relationship between the Christian and non-Christian peoples of early times adversely. But there is no doubt in the world that this endless sequence of martyrdoms was very largely imaginary. Also, the hideous details that were added to make the stories as, shall we say, spiritually stimulating as possible have been undoubtedly fashioned from the whole cloth. Instead of merely making the individual honor those who died for truth, it caused a, a very severe break in Christian psychology. 
It led undoubtedly to the development of the intolerance which has divided Christianity from other religions for the best part of 15 centuries. It was not the real circumstances that were entirely to blame, but this tremendous dramatization by means of which Christianity was opposed to all the rest of the world. And the, the rest of the world was really only an embodiment of evil. Even today, the Orthodox churches have a dilemma. Sin distort tolerance. We want to have a broader sympathy with the spiritual convictions of other people. But how can we? If by so doing, we are forced to acknowledge that they have spiritual graces without being of our faith. It seems as though we must betray the uniqueness of our own religious revelation in order to be tolerant with any other religious order. The, uh, the matter seems to have arisen from this tremendous drama of good and evil. The Old Testament built largely upon the fall of Adam. The New Testament is too closely involved in the desperate effort to align the world into two camps, the camp of the redeemed and the camp of the hopelessly lost. This situation could well arise if a group of unsophisticated people began to read the martyrdom of their faith. It would seem that every other nation in the world had existed only to torment the Christian believers. Well, there was persecution. There's no question about that. But in the hagiology, this has been rather grossly overstressed. And it has even continued into modern times, and most of the books that we read are stories that we read today relating to the relations between the Christians and the Romans, so to say, and made villains of the Romans and heroes of the Christians. Well, there was villainy, but not quite as much as has been suggested. There might be also a little villainy both ways, but that is definitely ignored. So out of this golden legend there uh, came a series of mixed blessings, we might say. Uh, there was certainly a strong statement of incentive. But the incentive was of one kind only, namely that the individual, uh, by living a certain kind of life, uh, would be acceptable in the sight of God, would escape the fires of eternal perdition. For most nations outside of the Christian realm, or outside of the Near East, also had their ideas about lost souls, or at least punishment after death. This arose at a comparatively early period in man's belief in mortality. But there has never been any group that has had quite as vivid a concept of this as has uh, disturbed the Christian heart and mind. In many instances also, the older beliefs had faded out in other nations while they were still vivid with us. Even today, there are many sects that are quite convinced of the reality of hellfire and damnation. They are not as numerous as they used to be, but they still exist. This the eternal punishment uh, for lost souls has to also have some other kind of psychological interpretation. The Greeks came probably the nearest to any in solving this problem. Namely, that perdition is simply the state of, of unenlightenment. An individual inhabiting a vicious nature is suffering the torments of hell. The person whose desires are frustrated 
becoming angry. And perhaps so desperately unhappy that he even kill himself. He's certainly the victim of a torment within his own nature. The uh, old people had no real understanding of how a person could torment himself so completely. So they had to have a little outside help to make things more difficult for him. Actually, the entire concept of damnation uh, was legitimate in its day. People believed it honestly and sincerely. But it again represented a very inadequate interpretation of uh, a belief. It was something that really never satisfied any of the essential requirements. While there is no cosmogony or anthropology in the golden legend, it does unfold a kind of universal theme of things. It was the basis of the first great books that were written in Europe concerning the origin of the world and the origin of humanity and of civilization. Like nearly all of these other early works, it was completely Western in its focus. It knew uh, consciously, or at least admitted, uh, to practically no world except the Mediterranean culture. Here, uh, in the Golden Legend, was set up a way of life, an order of life. At the upper apex of this entire problem, was the eternal glory of God and the uh, establishment of a great trinity of spiritual powers, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Uh, these beings are sometimes shown seated upon a rainbow. And at one time in Europe, there was a tendency to represent the, tri the trinity by a three-faced deity. This actually arose in Christianity, and there are images of God as a holy trinity with three faces and wearing the tiara. This is, a, however, this was something that did not, shall we say, catch the public fancy in the West. So examples of it are found only in early cathedrals and are very rare out-of-the-way places, but they do exist, and they have been reproduced in the This idea of the Trinity, perhaps the men moved in from Asia, but it was not popular. It never took hold. But we do find mother-headed deities among the Egyptians. In the Greeks, they are nearly always limited to demons or monsters of some kind. Below the uh, Trinity, the Holy Trinity, and the family of the deity, uh, was the great arch of heaven, the uh, wall of the firmament, which divided the celestial region from creation below. Sometimes deity is represented holding the world in its hands. Sometimes it carries the orb as the symbol of dominion, the scepter as the power of rulership over all things that live. The triple papal tiara, of course, represents the rulership of the three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell. Below the power of deity was gathered the assembly of the redeemed. Here were those who were saved according to the symbolism of the book of Revelation. Here were the elders that fell down to adore before the throne. Here were the blessed souls of the martyrs and the heroic dead. Here were the souls of the little children who had been baptized and redeemed. Likewise, in this area, were strange creatures from the mythology of every land that we can imagine, as strange and wonderful as in the apocalyptical description. Then there was a wall that divided the heavenly region from the visible world. 
Only the mystic or the seer could penetrate this wall and ascend finally into the presence of the eternal. Below this was the material world. And the material world fashioned as it was according to a strange molding, a strange precipitation as discussed in ancient Jewish metaphysical books. This was the world that was cast out of glory. The physical world was the fallen world. It was the world of mortality, of ignorance and superstition. It was the world of penalty and testing and trying. It was a world that existed only in order that human beings could make the decision between vir virtue and vice. It was a world of opportunity to be good and constant temptation to be evil. And when the angel with the flaming sword cast Adam and Eve from the sidereal garden, this angel stood at the gates of the lower world to permit no one to leave except according uh, to the laws and prescriptions of the faith. Well, this lower world was really under the power of evil. But in the early times, this power of evil was acknowledged largely for what it was, the prince of materialism. It was the world of visible and physical things, the world in which men uh, struggled in darkness, seeking in one way or another to sustain themselves, to earn their bread by the sweat of their brows. Men fell into this world as punishment. And in this punishing sphere, this lurking shadow of the Prince of Death was ever present. For this world was circumscribed by birth and death. And in this shadow was the power waiting to receive the souls of the dead, as in the Egyptian ritual. These souls were weighed or tested, or their names were sought out in the Book of Life. And if they had lived according to their faith, and had lived nobly, they might go to join the blessed souls. If they did not live nobly, uh, upon them all types of terrible punishments were inflicted. And they were assumed to go to everlasting despair. Here, I think, however, we have a little exaggeration over the original intent. I think the Egyptians probably gave the archetypal pattern, namely that those who did not achieve illumination and who did not therefore pass out of this life uh, spiritually mature uh, were simply required to be reborn again into material existence, and this was the symbol of perdition. The Egyptians had a monster called Python that devoured the souls of those that did not pass the judgment of the dead. And the souls were carried through the bodies of body of Typhon and were reborn in the material world. And this, I think, was the original meaning that got lost, however, in the early centuries when Christianity neglected the doctrine of reincarnation, which it had originally uh, accepted. So the tradition, the world of pain and sorrow, was the world of mortal things to which souls might return again to suffer all the mysterious and horrible penalties uh, described in Dante's Inferno. But as Plato pointed out, all these symbols of the horrors of perdition were simply caricatures of, mo of material life. They were merely aspects of the kind of things uh, that could naturally symbolize our excesses and our deficiencies. The individual who dies in hate is, is burned by the fires of his own passion. 
Would he not then properly be born into a region of hate? And where could he find a better place to be so born than in this world, where even now, after thousands of years of civilizing, uh, we are still inclined to hate each other? We hate those who oppose us even now. We hate to give the rights and privileges of existence to those who differ from us in any respect. Thus all the infirmities that we suffer are karmic, and uh, perdition is apparently the Christian name for karma. It is simply retribution. So in this region of retribution in which we all live, how shall we escape? And the answer to this appears to be that we escape through instruction of some kind. We escape through being invited to improve life by the birth within our own souls of a certain spark of insight, which as it develops, uh, gives us greater strength to resist the pressures and temptations of the outer life. In this respect, therefore, as in Oriental philosophy, there is recognized an order of teachers. And this order of teachers includes the heroes of Greek tradition, and the demigods of the Nordic legends, and the uh, divine mortals of uh, the Buddhistic philosophy. These are in truth the arhats, but the arhats are those that sometimes, somewhere, long ago, took the obligations of dedication. They, while still weak and infirm in their spiritual abilities and their spiritual resources, still most solemnly dedicated, uh, not only the life they were then living, but all the lives that would come to them to the service of their fellow men. Indian philosophy recognizes, therefore, this peculiar kind of dedicated soul. These dedicated souls are the virgin youth of ancient Hindu thinking. They are set apart, and at each incarnation, their destiny comes into manifestation with them. These dedicated persons, as arhats, are never completely aware of the fact of their own dedication. In fact, we are told that Buddha did not know in this world that he was a Buddha until the illumination. Up to that time, he was merely a truth seeker. But deep within himself was an achievement already highly advanced, whether he was conscious of it or not. The same of the Arhat. He has achieved a spiritual worthiness, which his name implies. He comes into this world like everyone else, born into the same infirmities and problems and situations. Therefore, the infinite diversity of appearances and attributes associated with him. There is, only, there is one difference, however. In him somewhere is this spark of dedication. He is by nature not as unkind as those around him. He is born more patient. He is born perhaps more forgiving, or perhaps with a, an innate dedication to some humanitarian purpose. All over the world, individuals are born like this. They are born to live for others. They do not know why. They simply feel that way. And in the old philosophies, it was believed firmly that these persons so born were actually 
the manifestations of a dedicated group that had arisen in remote time and in a long, wonderful procession walked down the ages, taking birth here and there, but always for one purpose only, the benefit of mankind. These individuals developed gradually great heroic ability. They became uh, far more advanced in their uh, conduct than the people around them. We can look down through history and we can say, could this not have been true in the case of Socrates? Was he not born? to be of benefit to mankind. Did he ever for a moment swerve from his holden duty? Did he not finally die rather than compromise his principles? But it would been, have been very easy to save his life. Was not Plato such a man? How shall we say also that great musicians and great artists great scholars, great scientists, if they be persons of noble dedication, are not actually the mysterious arhats that are described in the uh, wonderful sutra of the Lotus of the Good Law. These set aside ones whose lives are for virtues are represented in art as forming a radiant company around the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They may look upon the face of truth and live, and part of its light will be reflected to shine from their own faces and through their own eyes. I think the original concept of things has the same origin. People watching their neighbors were aware of something. We do not watch our neighbors very much anymore, except when they want to borrow something. But in old days, when people grew up together and children played with their neighbors and the whole village knew each other, the village knew that every once in a while a wise old man appeared among them. Perhaps he was merely a craftsman, perhaps he made shoes or cut headstones for the local cemetery. But he was a wise man. He was a good man. And in his face was a light of peace. And children loved him. And those in trouble came to seek his help. And in a simple, natural way, he was always willing to help. This man was seldom rich. He was not powerful, but was humble, not only by necessity, but perhaps by choice. He had few ambitions, wished no advancement, but simply wanted to live the life of a quiet person, helping his friends, and making some simple contribution to the economic security of the neighborhood. These, perhaps, were also I. The individual didn't have to know. That is a very important part of the story. The Ahat did not know he was an Ahat. He only lived as an Ahat. But because he so lived, the long chain of his karma was ripening him for enlightenment, for the final illumination. The miracles of the Ahat were probably the same in the East and West. The miracle of the kind word, the transforming power of the encouraging state, uh, the wonderful restoration of faith in man, simply when he meets another person who is essentially good, the wonderful inspiration of patience, of uh, responsibilities well met, of humility, and natural righteousness. All these things transform other people. And they produce the miracles of faith and salvation. So out of this concept of the good man, undoubtedly arose the belief in the saints. 
the saint was only the very good man. Because he was good, he was beyond temptation. Socrates did not hesitate to die for his principles. And all over the world, good persons have given their lives to the service of others and have not necessarily been martyred, but have fallen victims to many ailments and ills, trying to save other people. The man who dives in the river to save the child saves the child and drowns him. But there is some strange nobility about this, and only certain men will do this. They do not know why. But there is something in them that is not in everyone else. For it has not been developed to the same degree. So it would not be amazing or remarkable that the really devout person faced with either penalties or the preservation of his integrity to give up his fortune for truth. We choose to relinquish office rather than corrupt it. We choose to die in virtue rather than live in vice. These people exist. They always have existed. And in the early hagiology of the church, many such persons of a rather heroic, mysterious, and then even remote time who exemplified such virtues came to be regarded with exceptional grace. It is man's instinctive veneration of good, but it is also his instinctive realization that behind good there is some kind of a machinery, that it is not just an accident. That men do not suddenly decide to be good for no good reason. But the patient man has something behind him, Perhaps ages and patience. But the person who returns good for evil does so because of a strength that many others do not possess. Millions of good Christians appreciate the virtues, but not all of them can practice them. But when we find a person practicing magnificently, that which we might long to practice, but lack the courage, we pay tribute to that person inside of ourselves. We may not acknowledge it, but we respect it. And out of this respect for those whose spiritual achievements are extraordinary, came in the East the Arhat concept, and in India the Mahatma belief, in the Taoism of China, the marvelous sages with their metaphysical powers and in Christendom the same. So they are all brothers under the skin. They are all one concept developed according to the conditioning of various cultural patterns. The saint is therefore the unfolded self. And in psychology we know that the elder, the patriarch, the wise one in ourselves, uh, becomes more or less the symbol of enlightenment and of the capacity for enlightenment which we all inwardly possess. The saint, consequently, also becomes the intercessor. The saint stands between God and man to prove the possibility of man achieving uh, identity or unity with God. The saint is the one who proves that it can mysteriously but wonderfully be accomplished. It is a, it is a demonstration before the ages that virtue can win. A man has always had a respect for these virtuous ones. He may martyr them, but he will ultimately canonize them. He will seldom revere them during their lifetimes because they have interfered with his selfishness. But as he also disappears and new generations that are not touched by personal motives arise, the good man is elevated to his proper destiny. As he 
The other half uh, is therefore uh, a link indicating a state of consciousness, mid-distance between man and deity. It represents in the Eastern way of thinking the middle distance between ignorance and the complete illumination. The abode of the Arhats is the paradise of Amitabha, which is the middle ground between earth and heaven, even as the Paradiso of Dante stands between earth and heaven. It represents, therefore, as far as we can put the parts together now, the empire of the good, the over souls, who are to become the citizens of the New Jerusalem. The of the good, the now, in uh, trying to work this out physically or uh, historically, we see that we're up against a terrible obstacle. We have no evidence whatever uh, that we are going to be able to build a New Jerusalem that is going to be any better than the cities we now inhabit. We have no faith that our own skill is going to finally be so dramatically uh, transmuted that it will become the true skill of love for life. We do not, uh, we don't, we don't feel any confidence in this. But if we realize that there was a tremendous pattern of karma moving behind all this, that there is, as the Buddhist point out, points out, this tremendous body of testimony that when uh, Buddha gave his great sermon at the vulture's peak, the Arhats from the ten worlds all assembled. And the rows and rows of shaven-headed monks extended to infinity. These were the saints. They were not the saints uh, in the sense uh, of being canonized individuals, obviously functioning. These arhats were the, the internal achievements of all people. Uh, they were the innumerable levels of self-mastery. They represented dedication. According to the Buddhist belief, the first time the individual, unselfish, dedicates himself to good, even for one moment, even if with the full contrition of consciousness, he recites the Nembutsu, resolved at that moment in himself that he will dedicate his own evolutionary future to the good of mankind. In that moment, according to the tradition, a lotus seed drops into the pool of Amitabha's paradise, and from this lotus seed will grow the throne of the Bodhisattva to be. Once this dedication is made within the person, it cannot die. It may take a thousand lives to come to flowering, but once that seed is planted, once the individual has had one moment's flash of true insight, something happens that can never change, can never be taken away. He consciously may forget it in a moment. He may never realize that anything important has occurred to him. But in that moment of heart dedication, something has been planted within himself. This is the seed of his own eternal salvation. Those in whom this seed has been planted are the army of the redeemed. The 144,000 will be saved. And this number is simply a Kabbalah on the total population of man by mankind. It is all souls, which is also an oriental belief. 
that all things that live will ultimately be redeemed. But those who have consciously dedicated themselves to this labor have taken on all of the burden of the karma of regeneration. This dedication is not going to make life easy for them. In the name of this dedication, they may be born and die many times, and they may be martyred. They may voluntarily sacrifice their lives for countless causes. They may take body in uh, backward groups and be subject to ridicule and persecution. They may lead religious reforms and die martyrs because of the hatred of their fellow men. But if this dedication is true, every step forward in conviction is enlarging the heroic estate of that soul. In the fullness of time, it will emerge as a potential world teacher, a universal servant, one of those who are born to serve others. This order that has been impregnated with the consciousness of reality, with this middle kingdom between gods and men. And in Christianity, this place is the place of the saints. But many years ago, I talked about many of these problems with the present ecumenical patriarch of the Greek Church. Many years ago, I the head of the Eastern Catholic Church of the world. And he assured me that the early church was fully aware of the secret rituals and initiations of Egypt. That he was perfectly confident that their symbolism was derived from the most secret traditions of antiquity. That in some mysterious way, uh, the great wisdom of it all had been blocked out. That instead of being uh, developed as Eastern wisdom had been by the constant enlargement of insight, constant strengthening of the knowledge and persuasion of the great religious truth, that in the West, for some reason, by some circumstance, Everything had slowly faded out except a very simple moral teaching. But perhaps this was due to the peculiar nature of the people who had to be reached. Even the Buddha says, look at your man before you preach your sermon. And it is true beyond question that if the individual is incapable of understanding, he will misunderstand. it is true beyond question. So in the West, the tendency was to take all of these more complicated truths and reduce them to a single factor, factor, and that was sincerity. The sincerity of the person was his salvation, his faith, his gentle acceptance, which required no explanation or no reason other than that it was the will of God. It seemed at least at that time to be the most appropriate. And very likely it was, because there was very little to build on. You were dealing with an extremely simple type of human mind. A mind unlearned and unskilled. A mind that wanted only the most simple and inevitable beliefs. The belief in God to come soul in sorrow, the belief in salvation, to make a life here endurable, even though it might be full of pain and sorrow, uh, the hope, the constant hope uh, that the inevitable sinfulness of nature uh, might be cleansed by the grace of God the healing blood of the Lamb. These simple beliefs demanded very little of the individual except that he make some kind of a dedication, that he makes a cho make a choice 
to serve either God or evil. That he strive with whatever courage and strength that he has to keep faith with the Scripture as he understands it, with the faith as it is taught to him, to enter the cathedral or the chapel of the church prayerfully, and with all the devotion and, and heartfulness that he could. If this one of simple resolution could carry him, something happened in him. It was no longer a problem as to whether uh, he achieved a great obvious spirituality. It was not even so much a problem, perhaps, as to where myth began and facts ended. Perhaps this was another way in which the effort was made to create this simple moment of dedication in which the pearl of great price might be placed in the human heart. Baby seems to give us something of this. But the whole virtue of the procedure was a total uh, giving up of self in complete obedience to the divine will as it was understood. Perhaps the understanding was faulty, but this is not too important. Many faiths will prove faulty, but faithfulness will never fail. The individual who is sincere, even though his faith may be inadequate, experiences the wonderful internal growth of his own sincerity. That is one of the differences between Eastern and Western thinking. In the West, salvation depends upon the faith being true. In the East, salvation be begins and ends and depends upon the individual being true, true to that which he believes. If he believes, as some islanders did, that a dinner plate that was washed on the shore was a deity, and to that dinner plate they gave allegiance, and to that dinner plate they made their obligations of integrity, that integrity is what counts. It is not the face of the deity you worship, whether it be invisible or of wood or of stone. It is the worshipfulness in yourself that sets the mysterious evolutionary processes of spirituality in motion within us. Thus, it may not be fair to say that uh, the golden legend did not cause soul seeds to fall into Amitabha's pool. It is not fair to say that this simple, if somewhat to our mind, gruesome belief uh, did not at that time meet a need, did not cause the person to be a little better than he would otherwise have been, which was the essential purpose. There is no use really saying that had it been taught better, we could have changed the course of history. This is not really true. We are teaching better today, but our history is as bad as theirs was, but in a different way. All of our insight has not ended war. All of our knowledge and skill have not caused corruption to decline among us. Therefore, we cannot say that any particular degree of insight will save the individual who is innately selfish. But if something can strike at the root of his selfishness, if something within himself begins to venerate a power superior to himself, a standard of virtue greater than he has previously experienced, then in consciousness he moves along. The souls that were lived in Italy at the time when Jacobus de Vorgin was writing his book, 
went out of embodiment. Maybe they're back again. Maybe they've been back more than once. The great question that really concerns all of us is whether in some way for that time and under those conditions these souls receive lessons came to degrees of insight through simple piety, came to understand God through the most common simple service to our fellow men, whether such may not in turn have a great effect upon the course of the spiritual unfoldments of these beings. It all probably fits together to make one tremendous pattern. And this pattern is the gradual unfoldment of all beings through the so-called process of the uh, elevation of saints, first through beatification and finally through canonization. Beatification really corresponds very closely to the state of the Ahat in the northern school. Canonization corresponds to the Bodhisattva state. They probably are interchangeable in, in meaning. They may also be actually interchangeable in the psychic processes which produce them. But they are not interchangeable in the common parlance in which they have been stated. So uh, the study of the Golden Legend simply is this legend of the growth of the spiritual power of man, the legend of humanity led by the saints of old and being com constantly impelled to personal sanctification so that perhaps in some day in the infinite future it will be true that the, heaven, the new heavenly city can become part of the earth, not because men have made a sudden reformation of themselves in some dated year, but because the constant enrichment of consciousness behind the souls that come into birth, that the souls coming in discover a little more quickly in their maturity the destiny for which they were intended, that instinctively they turn from worldliness to the service of each other, placing friendship and truth above all considerations. Today this may happen when a man is 65 years old, but it is still an awakening. In another century it may happen when a man is 55 years old. If it ever happens when a man is 25 years old, then we will probably have a different world. All these processes are parts of motions, and I strongly suspect that the old symbolism of the mysteries and the religious philosophies of both East and West can be traced symbolically in the design of the martyrology of the Christian saints. It is a difficult pattern to trace, but I really sincerely believe it is there and that many of these legends and stories are simply adaptations from the achievements of the great and the good of all nations, gradually transposed into a Christian setting. In any event, uh, there is uh, something rather worthwhile if we can go beneath the surface, and for the sake of our own souls, it is always better to look beneath the surface for the truth there uh, than to be disappointed or in some way offended by surfaces. We are nearly always the victim of surface thinking. The moment we go below the surfaces of things, we begin to find the identities of life and truth. Well, our time is up, so I guess we'll have to conclude it for this time. Thank you very much. The subject for this evening is rather more interesting, perhaps, than the title would indicate. And 
It requires a kind of orientation, which I believe will contribute to our knowledge on a number of religious subjects. The story of the golden legend and its author, Jacob de Vorigen, belongs to the 13th century of the Christian era. The work and the man were strongly em em emphasized and influenced by the psychology of the time. The European culture was passing through what we now call the medieval period, a long and difficult time, distinguished rather for its reactionary tendencies than for any contribution to progress. The medieval European uh, was a person of extremely limited education and an almost completely provincial attitude. His life was circumscribed by old patterns and beliefs and folklore to a degree that it is difficult for us to appreciate. The church could not be different from its own time. Its clerics were drawn from the available material of the day. And even those who ascended to relatively high position in the ecclesiastical structure were men of very limited education and, in many instances, ability. We cannot, therefore, expect a great a mature philosophical work to rise from such conditions. We cannot even expect an outstanding literary production. We must recognize that the 13th century European depended almost entirely upon folklore for his moral instruction, for his ethical concepts of life, and for the fulfillment of his hungers for knowledge. Folklore at that time was derived from a number of different sources. Some European, some Near Eastern, and others North African. There was no clear effort to distinguish between the sources of material. They were heaped together. We have a few evidences of what might be termed the learned thinking of that time. And to our eyes, to our comprehension, the scene was most distressing. Yet we cannot say that there was not sincerity or dedication, or a great longing to discover a better way of life, or to attain a deeper understanding of the mysteries of religion. At that time in Europe, there was only one church. There were splinters in smaller areas, but the burden of Christianity rested with the development of the Catholic Church. And within this church were produced men who were to add greatly to the luster, not only of their faith, but of the arts, and to the great uh, contributions that they made, uh, we give natural homage. The story of the golden legend is essentially a martyrology. It was a kind of saint's calendar. And under each day of the year was a suitable sanctified name. 
It is obvious that Jacobus, who was a citizen of Genoa, was not too solid in his history. But in all fairness, we should point out that he admitted it. He tells us in his book when he is confused, and that is quite frequently, that he tried definitely to create an inspiring work that would contribute to the well-being of the faithful. As a result of his teachings and preachings, he was elected Archbishop of Genoa by the congregation, not by a political move, but by the natural uh, fondness that the people held for him. After his death, he was beatified, but never canonized. But the Dominican order has special rights to venerate him and to accord him many of the dignities of a saint. The martyrology, or the golden legend, deals with saints. And the more we study this work, the more we recognize that the tradition preserved in hagiology is far more interesting and perhaps more stimulating than the average person believes. We think of a saint simply as a very good person within the orthodoxy of his church who has been elevated to sanctification by an elaborate ecclesiastical process. This was not actually true in old times. The primary qualifications for sanctification in the beginning were martyrdom and miracles. Uh, the distinguished and pious person who died for his religion was held to have a peculiar estate superior to that of even the ordinary devout person. If, for one reason or another, the saint escaped martyrdom, then the proof of his sanctification uh, lay in miracles. These miracles might be performed during his lifetime, or they might be recorded after his death. The more common process was that miracles should occur at his tomb, or that persons with various uh, troubles praying to his honored name might find extraordinary relief from their miseries. These two general forms have still survived. And it is rather interesting to note that the golden legend, which is a, really a calendar of saints, was sufficiently popular in its own time to be perpetuated by nearly 500 manuscript copies. Of course, all this occurred before the beginning of printing. But so large a number testified to the great demand for the work. After the invention of printing, it passed through 150 editions, most of them comparatively early, however. An interest in the work began to decline with the Renaissance. At that time, humanism began to sweep the world, and men's attention was turned from matters of ancient religion to the pressing concerns of modern reformation. The various versions of the golden legend, however, continue to appear. And a recent English translation was published in 1941 under the imprimatur of Francis Cardinal Spellman, which would indicate that the subject has not entirely lost modern interest, at least within the body of the church. I think that the first thing we learn from the golden legend is something about the personalities, natures, and qualifications of the early saint martyrs. The more we study this uh, description, and a number of writers have remarked this point, which is not at all original with me, 
the more we realize that the saint really emerges as a transcendentalist. He is a magician. He is a sage. He was a seer. He worked miracles. He could transport himself invisibly from one place to another. He was able to appear in countless forms and to extend his ministry over inconceivable periods of time. When we are all finished with the, the general pattern, we see that there is a startling similarity between the saints of early Christendom and the wonder workers, magicians, yogis, and the arhats of Oriental religion. The saint, in many instances, was almost a complete parallel for the Buddhist arhat. He renounced the world. This he held in common with uh, most uh, religious groups. He practiced austerities. He gave up all physical honors and comforts. He sought only one thing, the grace of God. He proved his dedication by selfless service to others. And his miracles were nearly always performed for the benefit of the oppressed or the poor or the downtrodden. He held all the strange and wonderful powers that we associate with the Oriental Mahatma. Many of the sanctified persons were as eccentric and strange and difficult to comprehend as the old Arhats of Zen. And I imagine, had we any kind of uh, likenesses of them, they would indeed be equally a motley group of rich and poor, wise and simple, who had by one manner of effort or another had achieved that end which all well-disposed persons desire. That was the enrichment and fulfillment of eternal re and internal resources. Now it is interesting to trace something of the beginning of the story of the saints, not as individuals but as a type which in one form or another has appeared in so many parts of the world. Where did the Christian idea of canonization come from? It did not come from the Old Testament. It was not a common policy of the Orthodox Jews of that time. We find no real trace of it in Greek culture, nor does it show, formally speaking, in any phase of Roman belief. We say, formally speaking, because there is one parallel that may be worth noting. And that was the process of the deification of Roman emperors. Uh, a Roman emperor, however, when he was deified, uh, might have his likeness raised as a monument in the city, and he would receive popular veneration and adulation. Some emperors were deified during their lifetime. And so were some of the Macedonian kings of Greece. But in these instances, a deification was largely based upon some heroic incident. These uh, emperors were not deified because they were good. They were deified because they were powerful. They were recognized as examples of the prevailing psychological standard of the time, their strength and, if necessary, cruelty. These were condoned and applauded if they led to ultimate victory, if they advanced the destiny of the state, all personal considerations were ignored. Thus, the deification of the emperors, of either of uh, the Latin or the North African cultures 
really do not, really does not cover our point, but it has a bearing on it, as uh, we hope to demonstrate. The saint, as far as we can understand him, certainly appears to be an oriental importation. The type of person that was venerated and canonized by the early church possessed those virtues that were most applauded among Eastern peoples. This does not mean that the good man would not have been regarded as good in his own country. He might have been greatly beloved. He might have been remembered with extraordinary fondness. But our saint is not just this good man. He was good according to the way of his time. And in many instances, he was certainly a spiritual hero. But he was more than this. He was wise. He was skilled. He was learned in many ways, mostly in the ways of mysticism and esotericism. These words, of course, were never used, but his attributes indicated in this direction. So we might look a little bit to try and discover how it came about that about the first century A.D., this development of the idea of formal canonization or the bestowing upon the venerated dead certain spiritual powers of intercession with God try to understand this a little better, we will we'll probably have to travel a bit to another part of the world. When Alexander the Great led his conquests into the East, he reached as far as what is now Pakistan, and then the continual dissensions of his armies and uh, the desire of his soldiers to live to return to their own homes. Uh, dissuaded him from further conquest. In uh, what is now Pakistan, there developed a mingling of Greek and Indian culture, East Indian culture. Uh, this revealed itself by some, at least semi-permanent, uh, cultural monuments. After Alexander had departed, these naturally fell into decline. There was nothing to maintain the Greek influence in Pakistan. But about the beginning of the Christian era, Pakistan, this area of it, and parts of Afghanistan, became the outer boundaries of the Roman Empire. There was a communication between this area and Italy. Merchants traveled, artisans lived and in, in Pakistan and perpetuated Roman customs, Roman art. The peculiar mingling, therefore, of an Eastern tradition moving def definitely westward and a Western culture moving relentlessly eastward resulted in a, a very interesting a composite culture which has come to be known as Gandhara. Gandhara was a province or country of no great political importance, part of which is now in Pakistan and part in Afghanistan. From the first to the fifth century, the Gandhara enjoyed an extraordinary flowering of art, particularly sculpturing and modeling. Gandhara, during this early period, in the latter part of the first and the early part of the second century A.D., also became a great stronghold of Buddhism. And the country was 
literally covered with monuments of Buddhistic thought. Although Buddha himself had never actually journeyed through this region. In the early years of the second century AD, 